How are you guys doing? Good? Good, good 4th of July weekend so far? Yes. We um, went and uh, hung out with Chase, my son's future in-laws and got to meet all, just everybody. And it's, and it's great because uh, we're actually, most of them are half Asian, so I fit right in. Uh, <laughs> I'm just fitting right in with all of them, and, and it's kind of fun. The food was amazing, of course. Because when you get that many Asians in one place, there's uh, amazing food to be had. And uh, then we went with uh, uh, some of our church folks, and we enjoyed the incredible um, fireworks show in Ladera Ranch. And if you've never seen that fireworks show, it is the best. It is absolutely the best around, except for maybe Disneyland. Um, but it was just an awesome time. Well, we're going to talk about wisdom in public today. Wisdom in public. And uh, as we're kind of wrapping up our series in the book of Proverbs, we're going to begin next week uh, looking at Ecclesiastes. And um, <clears throat> in our midweek study, we'll be going through the book of Ecclesiastes. And so we have, uh, if you want to read ahead, you can read ahead in the first five chapters of the book of Ecclesiastes. But today we're going to talk about wisdom in public. And whether we're aware of it or not, uh, our actions have impact on other people. Our actions influence others. And so we need to be wise in how we behave in public. Not only is all of heaven watching us, you know, the Bible says that there's a great cloud of witnesses, right? So not only is all of heaven watching us, um, but our coworkers, our friends, our neighbors, uh, even strangers are watching us. And they're watching how we conduct our lives, they're watching how we carry ourselves, and they're making decisions about God based on what they see in you. You know, there's been said that our lives are sometimes the only Bible that people will ever read. And so they'll be looking at you and I and how we run our lives, how we conduct our lives, and, and they'll be asking, does your Jesus really work for you? And if it really works for you, is that the Jesus I want for my life? You know, it's amazing to me how, how many testimonies I've heard from a, a friend or a neighbor where they said, you know, this, this Christian came into my life and I just wanted what they had. I just so, it just so caught my attention that I wanted to have the Jesus that was in their life. I wanted to, him to be my Savior as well. And so we're going to look at three areas of our lives that are probably the most highlighted areas by Solomon in the book of Psalms. And the first one we're going to look at is our sexual integrity. It has to do with our sexual integrity. Probably the biggest one of all that Solomon talks about in the book of Proverbs. And so turn to Proverbs chapter 5. And if you need a Bible, we'll get one to you. Uh, just raise your hands, and we have Bibles for you today. Um, got our ushers up. Here we go. And uh, so Proverbs chapter 5. And we're going to look at the first, read the first six verses here. It says, My son, pay attention to my wisdom. Lend your ear to my understanding that you may preserve discretion and your lips may keep knowledge. For the lips of an immoral woman drip honey, and her mouth is smoother than oil. But in the end she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death, her steps lay hold of hell. Lest you ponder her path of life, her ways are unstable, you do not know them. So Solomon warns against giving in to the immoral women. And ladies, I think we can apply this to immoral men as well in our culture. Not just the immoral ladies, but the immoral men. Now what's interesting is this word immoral, uh, when you think about what does it mean to be an immoral person, well, in your mind you would think what? It has to do with someone that does bad things, right? But actually the word immoral means stranger. Did you know that? It actually means stranger. And it has to do with someone that is acting in a way that's strange to all the rest of us. You know, if you can imagine growing up in the nation of Israel 
and a, na- a nation that was given over to the worship of, of the one true God and following after the one true God. And so the way that they lived, the way that they conducted their life was to bring glory to the living God. And so when someone would come in that would be different than that, strange to that, that would bring in behaviors that were foreign to them, the outside nations, they would call that, you're a stranger, you're immoral, you're not like us, you're different. There's something that you're doing that isn't quite right. The idea is that an immoral person was a stranger or a foreigner to Israel because this kind of behavior was associated with the worship of idols, not with the worship of God. You see, that's, that's what it had to do with. And so it's something to think about, you know, as we conduct our lives, as we live our lives, are we living our lives in a way that brings glory to God and honor to God? Are we living our lives in such a way that, that is con- uh, consistent with a worshiper of God Or are we living our lives in a way that's consistent with a foreigner? No, with a stranger of God. We read concerning immorality in Numbers chapter 25, verses 1 through uh, 3. It says this. Now Israel remained in Acacia Grove, and the people began to commit harlotry or immorality with the women of Moab. They invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, And the people ate and bowed down to their God. So Israel was joined to Baal of Peor, and the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel. And so it was this immorality. It was strange to Israel. It was different. And that was the first step. First of all, they got involved in sexual immorality, and then it leads to idolatry and eventually into bondage. And we read that the nation of Israel had aroused the anger of the Lord. And it all began with this sexual immorality. Paul writing to the early church said in Ephesians chapter five, verses three and four, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks, giving of thanks. You know, God sees us as so much greater than we see ourselves, as so much higher than we see ourselves. And you would never see, you know, go into the the Queen of England, right? And you go into the palace, and she walks up to you and and cracks a fart joke. I mean, you would not have her do that. She would not do that, because that would be beneath her. That would be what a commoner would do, right? Now, Never mind. I'll leave my wife alone. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, that would be beneath her, right, to do that. But someone, you know, but for someone who's a royalty, she would think, she would speak in a different way, in a way that would be consistent with who she is and the title that she bears. You and I have been called royalty in the house of God. Now, it's always amazing to me that those who commit adultery or sleep around think that it won't catch up to them you know oh they'll never find out no one's ever going to know it's my little secret but solomon says her ways are unstable you do not know them when you're in that situation it's an unstable situation you don't know what the outcome is going to be you can't guarantee that the immoral person is going to keep it a secret that it's not going to come out Or one day you wake up and discover you're pregnant or that you have some kind of a disease. You know, you don't know what's going to happen. And it's it's amazing to me that it's always the jilted lover that calls up TMZ and sends the photos over, you know, and sends and sends the leaks out the recording or leaks out, you know, something to let people know what's going on. You know, former Clippers owner Sterling was brought down by his girlfriend. He didn't see that coming. You know, he thought he could buy her off. But she's unstable, just like Solomon said. Monica Lewinsky told her girlfriend, you know, hey, guess what I did last weekend? You know? And that call was recorded. And that recorded call got into people's hands. And that brought down a president. Uh, A friend of mine, Bob Coy, a pastor, was outed by one of his mistresses who felt guilty didn't want to cover it up anymore. 
unstable. You don't know what's going to happen. Ted Haggard, another leader in the church, was outed by one of his male escorts. You know? Unstable. You don't know what they will do. And so if you go down that road, it's an unstable road. Solomon warns us in Proverbs chapter 7, verse 25 through 26. We can turn over a couple of pages. It says this, Do not let your heart turn aside to her ways. It's an act of your will. It's a choice that you make. Don't go in that direction. Do not stray into her paths, for she has cast down many wounded, and all who were slain by her were strong men. She only takes down the strong. She goes after the ones that are the strong. In another translation, it talks about the young men, the strong young men. And guys, it will be the end of you. And here's the thing. There are no statutes of limitations on this kind of sin. When the truth comes out, and it does come out, the damage will be done. Doesn't matter how long ago it happened, it always comes out, and the damage is done. Ladies, your sexual integrity is priceless. It's priceless. It's so precious. It's so to be protected. Don't give it away, cheap. Don't give it away. Keep it close to your heart. It's yours. It's it's a one once in a lifetime gift that you've been given. And it's only to be given to the one who's willing to give everything for you. You know, only to the man who loves you enough to devote himself totally to you by putting a ring on your finger and marrying you. And I've talked to young ladies, young single ladies. Oh, but he loves me. He really loves me. You know, we're we're so in love. And I think I think to myself, great. Show me the diamond ring and the signed piece of paper that tells me that you own half of his life. Then I'll know that he loves you. But if he's not willing to do that for you, then he's only using you. Don't let yourself be used. Protect what God has given you. Young men, stay true to the Lord. Treat God's daughters with respect. You know, God says to the husband that you are to love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. That men, we are to lay down our lives. And young men, we can begin doing that now. We can begin now learning how to lay down our lives and serving those that those God's daughters that he's brought into our lives and we can love them and we can serve them by protecting their sexual integrity, not taking advantage of it and being able to offer them up to whoever they're going to marry and say, you know what, I, pr- I love this person, I protected this person and now I'm giving them to you and I'm a man of honor and I've kept my word to the Lord. You know, as one guy used to say to us when we were in high school, you know, you never know. You might be sleeping with someone else's wife. That's gross. When you're, you know, when you're a teenager, you start thinking about that. It's like, that's gross, man. I, I don't know about that. I, that gave me the creeps whenever I heard that. But lay down your life for these precious daughters of God. Love them and protect them. Wisdom says, stay away from immorality because it will only hurt you it will rob you and I can I don't have the statistics with me this morning but there are statistics that that show that those that uh, that that uh, fell into sexual immorality before they were married have greater instances of divorce than those that didn't it's just a reality in our culture now the second area has to do with relational integrity having integrity in your relationships. And let's turn over to Proverbs 22. Proverbs 22. Just a, a final thing on that last thing. I remember uh, talking to someone who, uh, you know, who's kind of a, in the ministry and that sort of thing, and, and a person came up to them, and, and they were trying to say, hey, can I give you a Bible? Can I minister to you? And, 
and the person that they were going to wasn't a Christian and says, listen, I know how you live your life. I know what you do on the weekends. Why would I want a Bible from you? Why would I want to receive anything from you? You see, talking about sexual integrity. And so it matters. It matters to people. It matters in community how you live your life. Proverbs 22, verse 24 through 25 says this. Make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man do not go, lest you learn his ways and set a snare for your soul. And then turn back to Proverbs chapter 13. And we're going to look at verse 20. It says, He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. Be wise in who you choose to be your friends. They will influence you. And what's interesting to me is that this isn't an, uh, an encouragement just to the young. I see it all the way through people's adult life. Uh, them deciding to uh, make friends with people that will eventually bring them down and influence them. Solomon is clear. If you make friends with an angry man, you will learn his ways and you'll set a snare for your soul. You know, I've had some experience uh, recently uh, in the last few years with the court system. And I haven't met one person in jail that ever planned to be there. Not one person ever planned to be there. In fact, most of the people I've met in jail are all innocent. You know, so they tell me. They're all innocent. And their downward spiral always begins by becoming friends with an angry man or a group of angry men. You know, I got in the most trouble in my life when I hung out with a group of guys that just every, you know, on the weekends they like to go out and just cause trouble in the neighborhood. They were angry men. And uh, we threw sticks at people and rocks at old men that were doing their yard work. And we did all kinds of stupid stuff and, and even got arrested one time for that. And, you know, it wasn't fun. It wasn't, and, uh, you know, and I wasn't the one doing it. I was just hanging out with them. You know, they brought me down. You know, just hanging out with them brought me down. But it always begins by becoming friends with an angry man, a group of angry men, and now they're trapped, and their families are trapped, and their kids are snared. They can't get out. I have a friend that even has a, a ministry out in, uh, in Los Angeles where they'll go into some of these gang areas, and some of these guys have never left the street that they're on because if they were to leave that street, they would be killed. They would be sought after. They would be assaulted. You know, they would be seen as a, as a, as a uh, kind of a territorial thing. So they go in with vans, with blacked out windows. You, can't, you don't know what's, who's in there. And they'll go in, they'll pick people out, and they'll take them to the beach. Some of these guys have never seen the beach because they can't leave their area. They'll take them to the beach, they'll give them, and they'll minister to them. They'll tell them about Jesus, and then they'll take them back home. And that's their ministry, just to reach out to those who are trapped by the ways of the angry man. You know, it's the same thing for women. Ladies, if you're married, don't take advice from an angry, divorced woman. Don't do it. Uh, it, it, it will cause you problems. You know, girlfriend, I got sick and tired of being sick and tired. So I just dumped him. You know, you can do better than that guy. You know, just leave his sorry butt. You know, it's my time for me time. Right? You've heard that, haven't you? There's a whole movie coming out about all of this. And I've sat in my office on more than one occasion where a couple comes in and the wife is leaving. And it all started because she got caught up with her, you know, her divorced girlfriends. Hey, let's go out to the bars and let's go dancing. And they go out dancing and what happens? They meet some guy and then you're sitting, you know, a few months later she wants to leave her husband. Why? Because she found someone else. How did that happen? You know, she started hanging out with angry people that led her astray. Not thinking of the consequences of their foolish actions or how their decision will affect their kids, their homes, 
or their husbands. You know, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15.33, Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. You know, if you hang out with people that are evil, you're going to learn their ways, and it's going to pull you down. Now, Proverbs says, if you walk with wise men, you will become wise. You know, if you want to live a different life than what you live now, uh, if you want to live a different life than what you know, find some wise men and women and start hanging out with them. Find some people that are, are wise in business, wise in marriage, wise in ministry, wise in family, and let them influence you, you know? You always become like those that you hang out, out with. And so I, t- I try to surround myself with people that are way, way better than I am, way smarter, way wiser, because I just want it to just, you know, I just want some of their wisdom just to leak off on me, you know, just to, just to kind of fall off on me. And that's who I surround myself with. You know, I'm thankful for the wise men that have had a profound influence uh, in my life. I think of Pastor Chuck, who I had the privilege of serving with and watching him up front and, and learning you know, how he made the decisions he made and, and seeing his faith and his trust in God. You know, I, I mean, what kind of a, a, a leader would ever entrust a church to a 19-year-old kid? And yet Pastor Chuck wrote the check and bought the building for what is now known as Harvest Christian Fellowship with Pastor Greg Lauren. He was 19 years old when he did it. You know, just a, a young guy. David Rosales, who I consider to be uh, my pastor. You know, I, I look to him for wisdom and, and I look at what he's accomplished and I, and I learn from him. Skip Heitzig and John Corson, both men that I served with and I saw their lives up close and I can tell you they're the real deal. They are really in love with Jesus. And they live their lives as sold-out believers. I'm thankful for the guys that I pray with twice a month. Neil Travisano from Calvary Chapel, Mission Viejo, Steve DeNicola, and Kevin Hayashida. Wise men whose names you'll, you, you'll no, never really recognize. You don't really know who they are. But they have strong, solid ministries, and they have a solid track record for faithfulness in the Lord. And it's that solid track record for faithfulness in the Lord that I want to learn from. I want to learn from uh, and walk with wise men to learn their values, their principles. I want to learn from their faithfulness to God. You know, I don't, I'm not all that attracted to the most hip, coolest, newest, most rocking thing on the planet. I don't have much to learn from there, but the guys that have been in, in life for many, many, many years, those that are way beyond me, in, in living and have built solid ministries. Those are the ones I want to learn from. And let me ask you, who are the wise men in your life? Who are the wise men that are surrounding you? Those with solid track records of faithful service to the Lord. Wisdom says, walk with them and you will become wise. Walk with them and you will become wise. Now, the third area has to do with leadership integrity. Leadership integrity, having integrity as a leader and how that influences uh, the culture around us as believers. And let's look at Proverbs chapter 8. Turn over to Proverbs chapter 8. And we're going to look at verses 12 and six, uh, through 16. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 12. It says, I, wisdom... Dwell with prudence and find out knowledge with discretion. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogance in the evil way and the perverse mouth I hate. Counsel is mine and sound wisdom. I am understanding. I have strength. By me, kings reign and rulers decree justice. By me, princes rule and nobles, all the judges of the earth. You know, leadership is the God-given capacity to influence a specific group of people towards God's purposes for that group. It's a God-given capacity. 
Now, it doesn't matter whether you're the leader in a secular corporation or a Christian corporation. The fact that God has made you a leader and has placed you in that group, God wants you to fulfill his purposes for that group, to lead that group of people into what God has for them. That's what leadership is. And if God has called you to leadership, then the book of Proverbs is an essential manual for you to refer to uh, often to make all your leadership decisions. It's something that you should keep by your side and something that you should consult on a regular basis. Because wisdom is the key to strong leadership and wisdom begins with honoring, respecting, and revering the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And there are a number of Proverbs that give us little words of wisdom for effective leadership to those who serve and those who lead. So we're going to look at some of those. First of all, for those who serve, for those who serve other leaders. We turn over to Proverbs 21, or excuse me, 22, Proverbs 22. We're going to read the first verse. It says, a good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, loving favor rather than silver and gold. And now down to verse 11. He who loves purity of heart and has grace on his lips, the king will be his friend. If you love purity of heart and you have grace on your lips, the king, the leader, will be your friend. Let's turn over to Proverbs chapter 16. Proverbs chapter 16. Verse 13 says, Righteous lips are the delight of kings, and they love him who speaks what is right. You know, leaders are always looking for people that they can trust. They're looking for trustworthy people. And those who love purity of heart, have grace on their lips, and speak what is right, those are people that leaders can always trust. They're always looking for those people. Do you have purity of heart? Do you love that? It's grace on your lips. You know, a company I worked for, it was rumored that, you know, one of the salesmen would take buyers on a yacht, and they would go out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, and then they would do things that married people shouldn't do. And they would do that in the name of business, you know. And what's interesting to me is that he was successful for a season. He got a lot of orders for a short season of time. You know, because the buyers wanted to do, you know, your guy, your buyer, hey, I'll do business with you. But eventually those buyers were let go, the ones that participated in that. Why? They didn't love purity of heart. They weren't men of integrity. And they acted foolishly, and they couldn't be trusted by their leaders. Their own leaders couldn't trust them because of their behavior. You know, do you love purity of heart? Do you have grace on your lips? Do you speak what is right? You will be a person that leaders can trust. In chapter 22, verse 29, it says, Do you see a man who excels in his work? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before unknown men. You know, leaders are always looking for talented people who excel in their work. You know, you don't have to bite and scratch your way to the top. You know, the world will tell you that you got to claw and scratch and fight and, you know, just eke out every existence. No, you don't have to do that. Let your work speak for itself. Do excellent work and you will be taken to the top. You'll get recognized and bring glory to God. You know, all promotion comes from the Lord. And so just be faithful and keep growing in what you do. You know, I haven't done, played a lot of places. I didn't, you know, I didn't have to, you know, at, when I was in the music business, I didn't spend my time doing 200 gigs a year like a lot of people do. I just was good at what I did. And so when I went out and I played the few places that I did, it, it accomplished what God wanted to accomplish. And as a result, you know, God gifted us with songs, and those songs were sung all around the world, and they continue to be sung around the world today. I didn't do anything to get out there and scratch and, you know, and promote myself and try to make it happen. God promoted it. All I did was I was faithful to do a good job with everything I was given, and God was the one 
that blessed it. If you're a leader, for those that lead, turn over to Proverbs 20, chapter 20. In verse 28, it says, Mercy and truth preserve the king, and by loving kindness he upholds his throne. And then flip over to Proverbs 29, verse 14. It says, The king who judges the poor with truth, his throne will be established forever. You know, if you want longevity and leadership, lead with mercy and truth. Be a leader that's compassionate, that's kind. You know, you don't have to be uh, a hard-nosed leader to get ahead. That's kind of what some of the, uh, what we're told in management classes and stuff. Hey, just, you know, just be hardcore and, you know, they're not your friends. They're your, they're your you know, people that work for you and you just got to be hardcore with them. Tell them the way it is. But the thing is, is that here Solomon says, no, mercy and truth preserves the king. Loving kindness is what upholds his throne. And if you operate out of mercy and truth and loving kindness, you know, you'll be a leader that people will want to follow. You'll be a leader that people will want to be a part of, a company that people want to work for. You know, they'll be coming to you because they love what you stand for. The last thing is Proverbs 31, verses 4 and 5, for those that are leaders. It says, It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes intoxicating drink, lest they fall and forget the law and pervert the justice of all the afflicted. Now, I know this is a controversial subject in South Orange County. And uh, I know that uh, even in our town, there's several churches and several pastors that, that are open about drinking and uh, they're known for their wine collections or they're known for, uh, they'll preach about it from the pulpit, about uh, beers and that sort of thing. But Proverbs cautions leaders saying it's not for kings to drink. It's not for kings to drink. Lest you drink, and forget the law, or worse of all, that you pervert justice, that you pervert justice. You know, this also applied to the high priest. The high priest was not to drink, and Paul applied it to the overseers of the church. Men are not to be given to wine if you're called to be an overseer, a pastor of a church. You can also include medical marijuana or any substance that alters your consciousness. Why? Why does God not want leaders to do this? Well, God wants you to have a clear mind. God wants your mind to be clear and ready for anything that comes your way because you never know when you're going to be called upon to make a decision that is going to affect other people. You never know when you're going to be called upon to make a decision that's going to, be, that's going to affect other people. I've been, you know, one of the things that... that uh, you know, as a pastor, I'm on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You know, I, I protect my family as much as I can. And as God raises up other men in our church that, that we can hand off ministry to, you know, I'll be, they'll, they'll be the ones that are on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and so that uh, I can have more time with my family. But the reality of it is right now it's just me. So, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And there, I've had people show up on my doorstep at one in the morning, I've gotten calls in the middle of, you know, of the night, you know, hey, can you come down and help me out, you know, and what would it happen if I was going to help someone with a DUI, you know, kind of picking them up, and then I got a DUI on the way down to helping them, you know, that would be a bummer, wouldn't it, wouldn't that be a drag, i tell you, one of the most frightening things I heard was uh, of some paramedics that told me, oh yeah, we, you know, we'll, we'll toke up, we'll smoke some marijuana, you know, and I'm thinking, but you're on call, what would happen if you got a call and you're high? And I, my life is going to be in your hands? Makes it a little bit more, brings it a little closer to home, doesn't it? You know? Those of us that are parents, you know, we know if you got kids, they do crazy stuff. They're unpredictable. You know, and they could, they could you know, decide, hey, I'm Batman. I can fly and jump off a two-story, 
you know, landing, and, and, and my kids used to do this. They'd jump off the two-story landing and land on the couches below. You know, I found out about this because I found all their, their little video clips that they made in my camera one day. You know, and I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, you guys are doing this in my house, you know? And, uh, and they, they had, you know, they just would have fun. Uh, we didn't know that that's what was happening. But imagine what would have happened if something would have gone wrong and I would have had two or three glasses of wine. I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden, I can't take care of my kids. You know, people that I've been entrusted to, I never know what's going to happen. And so because of that, I've made the choice to set that aside, to be a leader. Not only that, not only am I not prepared, but I'm vulnerable to public humiliation. It says here in Proverbs 20, verse 1, uh, let me read this to you, it's kind of, a, it's kind of funny. It says, Proverbs 20, verse 1, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. And then in Proverbs 23, verse 33, uh, it says this, Your eyes will see strange things, and your heart will utter perverse things. You know, you'll just start seeing things, imagine things that aren't there that you imagine, you know. People laughing at you because you're, uh, of how stupid you look. You know, oh, dude, it was so hilarious, man. You were just like stumbling, falling all over everywhere, you know. That was so funny. You know, I saw a very dignified lady at a, at a, at a wedding fall out of her chair in her very expensive dress, you know, and everybody's laughing at her. And I'm just thinking, oh, man, how embarrassing. How embarrassing for that lady. Besides, you have to ask yourself, you know, it's not a sin to drink. Don't get me wrong. The Bible doesn't say don't drink. The Bible says don't be drunk. So it's not a sin to drink, you know. But you have to ask yourself, if the only way I can have a good time, if the only way I can hang out with you is for me to get drunk or to have a couple of drinks or to smoke a joint or do whatever you do, if that's the only way that we can hang out together, is that the only way I can relax? What's wrong with that picture? What's wrong with that picture? Because Jesus said, I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. I've, given, I've come to give you life that's full of joy, that's full of laughter, that's full of excitement, that's full of that's full of, you know, freedom, and that's full of, you know, that's just overflowing. I'm, that's the life that I've come to give you. Why would I want to cover that life up with something else? Why would I want to dull down the life, the abundant life that Jesus has given to me? Why would I want to do that? You know, when you're around a group of believers and they're all filled with that abundant life and it's just overflowing, it is the best time you have ever had in your life. You know, you, you don't, you know, let me just tell you this, my wife doesn't have to get drunk or stoned or anything to make the whole room laugh. She's just filled with the joy of the Lord. And it just, it just spills out over, she's crazy in a group of people. <laughs> It's insane. It's just, it's fun to watch. I married my entertainment. And, uh, and I'll, so I'll just like sit back and I'll watch just how she lights up her room. It's just, it's just fun to be there, you know? But that's the abundant, overflowing life that Jesus has for you and for me. Why would I want to cover that up? Unless you don't have it. Unless really what is going on is you don't have it. You're not experiencing that life. You haven't been filled to overflowing with the Holy Spirit. You don't know the joy of that, of that just life that bubbles up. It says out of your bellies will flow rivers. It just bubbles up out of your belly, you know. You don't know what it's like to have so much joy in your life. It just kind of bubbles up from your belly, you know. Think about that kind of a joy you know just kind of just keeps keeps flowing but that's what God has for you and for me that's what God wants for us and let me tell you something when you have that kind of joy 
and that kind of life flowing out of you, you will change the world. You will change the world that God has placed you in. You will change your neighborhood. You will change your office. You will change your friendships. You will change everything. So you can see it's important. It's wisdom. For the leader, again, it's not wrong. It's not against the law to drink. But it's not wise. It's not wise because you never know when God's going to call upon you to be used for his glory. And so you want to be ready, ready for whatever he has for you. And so how do we live? How do we work? How do we respond in a public sense? Number one, we need to walk in sexual integrity. We need to love our wives. We need to protect, if you're single, you need to protect those that God has brought into your life for the purpose of presenting them to him as a, as the, as a glorified body of Christ. Secondly, as a, um, as a, uh, a person that has relationship, you need to choose wise friends you know, so that those wise friends will not only impact your life, but you can be an impact in the lives of others. You might say, well, what does that say? Are we going to just create a holy huddle now? Are we not going to reach out? Oh, no, totally not. That's not what I'm saying at all. Don't get me wrong. You know, because there's a lot of people out there that need Jesus, you know. And when I go out into the world, I go out to bring Jesus to them. I don't go out to have a beer with them. You know, I go out to bring Jesus with them. You know, I, I get around people so that I can bring the gospel to them, so I can be light and salt to them, because I've got life, an abundant life, and I want them to experience what I have. You know, but I'm not out there befriending them and trying to be like them. You see, that's the difference. And then the third thing is, is that we need to have leadership integrity, integrity of how we lead in our neighborhoods and in our areas. The greatest example we have of leadership integrity is Jesus. Jesus himself. He's the one that showed us the example. And in all three of these areas, he excelled. He kept himself for his bride, which is you and I. He kept himself for us. He so loved us that he demonstrated that love to us by dying on the cross for our sins and making a way for us to be forgiven. He demonstrated relational integrity in that he is wisdom, and he brings that wisdom to you and I and says, come and learn of me, for I'm lowly, and meek. Learn my ways, you know. Paul said, learn of me as I imitate Christ. You know, imitate me as I'm imitating Christ. And then the third thing he did is he demonstrated the greatest leadership integrity and in that his kingdom is built on the principle of mercy and truth. It's known for loving kindness. And so you and I, no matter where we're at, we can come to him just the way we are, and he receives us just the way we are. And he heals us, and he restores us, and he renews us. And those things that are inside of us that keep us down, he takes them out so that we can be truly free. And so this morning as we look to the communion table, I'm going to invite the uh, ushers to come forward for communion. As we look to communion this morning, Maybe reflect in your own heart and your mind and ask the Lord, Lord, is there, is there an area in any of these three areas that I need to surrender to you, that I need to submit to you to allow you to do that work in my life? Let's pray. Father, we just look to you now and we ask, Father, that you would speak into our hearts. And Lord, if we've been living our lives in a way that isn't wise, that isn't walking in your wisdom, that Lord, we want to walk in your ways. We want to be a people that glorifies you. A people that as, as others look upon our lives, Lord, that they would give glory to you. That they would give glory to you and all that you've done in our lives, Lord. And this morning, as we approach your communion table, Father, 
that you would search our hearts. And Lord, if there are areas that we need to surrender to you this morning, Father, we want to surrender them. Lord, just bring them up. In Jesus' name, amen.